Uh, let me begin, um, first of all, by uh, correcting the title, spelling anyway, on the um, copy uh, that uh, you have uh, online. So it's um, Xin Xin Ming. Uh, I'm using uh, two uh, different uh, spelling conventions, Pinyin and Wade Giles here, um, because I wanted to indicate these are not the same word. Uh, they actually sound exactly the same, Shin Shin, uh, Ming. Maybe the tone is different. What about that, Shuang? Is the tone different from one Shin to the other? That's correct. The two Shin has uh, different tones. Different and the tone. first one is uh, a fourth tone, so uh, going mm -hmm. down Shin. And Shin. The, sec yeah, the, uh, the second, the, the hard mind is uh, uh, the first tone, so it's first Shin. Xin, xin mian, yeah. Okay, thank you. But you wouldn't see that in print, of course. You can't hear the tones. Sure. So uh, the reason I spelled it H S I N for uh, the first and then S H I N was simply to indicate they don't mean the same thing. Yeah. So uh, it's um, trust, trust and mind. So trust in mind is what we would say is uh, the title. So I just wanted to. Uh, uh, correct that. And um, this was first done uh, actually uh, for the, uh, Dharma Crafts, which was a Dharma supply business uh, that Diane Eagles, a longtime member of our Sangha and one of our teachers now, uh, had. And she would put a copy of this into each order, free, you know, so thousands of these uh, went out in. Uh, Dharma craft uh, orders, and that, that's how it's been circulated mostly. <laughs> and she's now in business again, uh, actually, and she's going to uh, print this again, and I told her to correct the spelling. Actually, she inquired about it, so this spelling error will soon be corrected. Uh, let me do this. So that was the first publication. And the second publication was in uh, this book, a Zen source book, um, which uh, I edited along with uh, Stephen Addis. Um, we have some of Steve's calligraphy in, uh, in the Dharma room, actually. He was a brilliant calligrapher and a Buddhist scholar, and he died a few years ago. Uh, Zen source book. So Judy and I and uh, Steve put this together. And I'd like to begin the class by uh, reading uh, the introduction to the Shin Shin Ming uh, in uh, this text. So, uh, Seng San in Japanese, Sozan, was the third patriarch of Chinese Zen, having received transmission from Bodhidharma from Bodhidharma's successor, we called. Uh, Seng San may have been suffering from leprosy when he met we called. And later tradition records their moment of truth, which echoes we uh, famous encounter with uh, Bodhidharma. You know, my mind is troubled, it's not at rest. Please put my mind at rest. And Bodhidharma says, bring your mind out here. And Rico says, when I look for my mind, I cannot find it. And Bodhidharma said, I have just pacified your mind. So same sort of uh, story. So Sin San went to Wiko and said, my body is gripped by a fatal disease. Please, Master, wipe away my sins. And Wiko said, uh, bring your sins out here and I will wipe them away for you. Sun San sat for a while and then said, when I look for my sins, I cannot find them. And we co-answered, I have just wiped away your sins. So that story. So he received uh, transmission, Sang San received transmission uh, from uh, we call. Uh, and uh, almost as soon as he did, Buddhism was persecuted in China uh, for 15 years. So he spent those 15 years wandering, hiding in the mountain, practicing uh, in caves, sort of that. 
a kind of life that he had for 15 years, not actually teaching, but out of all of this hard training comes this poem. Uh, the first on record that is attributed to a Zen master. In the year 582, he met uh, Dao Xin, who was to become his pupil, and thereupon the fourth patriarch, and in this way the transmission of Zen continued. So the title uh, Xin Xin Ming has the literal meaning uh, trust, mind, inscription. The uh, character for the first Shin is composed uh, of two parts, uh, showing a man or person, just like that, standing by his words, the so three horizontal lines, and then uh, a square like speech coming out of a, uh, a mouth. So that's uh, the first uh, Shin. The second Shin is the familiar uh, character for heart mind. It's like this with sort of like a beating heart is uh, what, what, what the uh, character is. And uh, that means heart mind or simply mind or simply heart, better to heart hyphen mind is the best translation. Uh, and then the um, name, sorry, um, carving or inscription. And it's a complicated character that means a carving in metal. It's kind of two parts, like writing on metal that makes up the word. Uh, and so it means inscription. Uh, so you know, that's the title, the trust mind inscription. Uh, we would say that uh, in terms of themes, the Xin Xin Ming blends uh, Taoist and Buddhist teachings both. So uh, I think it's pretty well known that Taoism has a strong influence on the development of Zen. Teachings of oneness, equality, and uh, suchness, and interpenetration. So the Buddhist teachings are, uh, blending Taoist and Buddhist teachings, the Buddhist teachings would be Avatamsaka Sutra, uh, teaching, the Huayan uh, scriptures. So Xin Xin Ming introduces us to a vast and meticulous world in which time and space no longer have their ordinary meanings and in which, to quote from the poem, bright and empty, the mind shines by itself. So the poem uh, consists of 146 lines and differs from standard Chinese verse uh, in two ways. Uh, one is that the lines are unrhymed. It's just about all classical Chinese poetry, the lines rhyme. Uh, Chinese is an easy language to rhyme in. Uh, lots of rhymes available. But Xin Xin Ming, no rhymes. And uh, it has only four characters. All the characters are monosyllabic. So four monosyllabic characters in each line instead of the usual five or six. Uh, creating a, a terse, uh, no nonsense sense of movement. Boom, 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 boom. And I asked uh, Shuang if she could recite uh, a few lines in Chinese so that we can hear uh, what it sounds like uh, in the original. So, is this uh, the first stanza that uh, you're doing, Shuang? Uh, yeah, uh, Stan, I did not hear the last sentence. Is this the first uh, what? Uh, yeah, so well, I'll just read the translation of the first stanza. I think that's what you're, you're doing for us, right? Yes, yes. Uh, so the great way is not difficult, just don't pick and choose. Cut off all likes and dislikes, and it is clear like space. So in Chinese. In Chinese, that race, uh, I will stop, uh, you know, after each of the four four characters. So that's one verse. So you can see, you know, the stopping point. So from start is, zhi dao wu nan, wei xian jian ze, dan mo zeng ai, dong ran ming bai. So I'm going to ask you to recite it again, and I want everyone to listen for the word dao in the first line and the word Ming 
in the last line. They're both very important words. So could you uh, recite them again? Sure. 至道无难, 危险检责, 淡漠赠爱, 动然明白, so that's uh, the Tao and the Ming Stan yeah. was referring to. Okay. Thank you very much. Any, <clears throat> any questions for Shuang on her Chinese recitation? Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> no, thank you. And you said you had to ask your mother about the pronunciation of one of the characters? What? Yes, uh, none of those characters are kind of the hard to read one, but just the one of them I don't use very much. Uh, I will <laughs> tell you which one that is. Uh, is uh, the uh, the third character in the second line, um, the jian, which is the choose or choose or pick in Chinese. Usually we just say choose or pick. They mean the same, so we usually use the, which is the same. Zhe and jian means okay. the same in Chinese, so pick and choose. So I, yeah, I just per personally use the uh, choose, uh, which is zhe, and don't use the pick as often. So I was like, <laughs> okay, let me make sure that's what that is. But yeah, okay, the other well, thank one. Thank you very much. <laughs> that's enlightening. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have here uh, next, I guess it's, uh, yeah, st yeah, still looking at the, uh, the textbook, uh, that... Um, Chan Master uh, Sheng Yang, who's a few generations after um, Cheng San, uh, says that the um, Qin Qin Ming uh, is a, a practical guide to meditation rather than a philosophical treatise. And uh, that's something we should uh, keep in mind uh, throughout it. Uh, I think most of us would see this as Buddhist philosophy, uh, maybe derived from uh, you know an earlier Taoist uh, uh, philosophy. Um, but um, I think I uh, agree that what Sung San uh, actually wants us to do is to learn how to meditate. That's the primary goal, uh, not to uh, drench our minds in philosophy. Not that there's anything wrong with that. So uh, we'll pause here uh, for any questions and um, go on actually to the, uh, then to the first section. And uh, let's, let's just continue then. And uh, I'll read you know, each, um, each section and then uh, we can have uh, you know, short discussion questions um, uh, on each of these sections. So the first section, um, I'm not sure where I got these titles. I may have made them up. You know, I first worked on this 20 years ago, and then most recently 15 years ago. So there are some things I uh, I don't remember how I how I came uh, by them uh, actually. Um, but um, I entitled the first section here "Non Duality and the Tao." Non Duality and the Tao. Uh, and I'll read these four stanzas. So the first section is the first four stanzas. Uh, the great way is not difficult. Just don't pick and choose. Cut off all likes and dislikes, and it is clear like space. The slightest distinction splits heaven from earth. To see things as they are, don't be for or against. Likes and dislikes are the mind's disease. If you miss the deep meaning, stilling thoughts is useless. It is clear as vast space, nothing missing, nothing extra. If you choose or reject, you cannot see things uh, as they are. Uh, the first thing I want to comment on is the fourth line, the last line in the first uh, quatrain. Um, does anybody uh, recognize the, the phrase I'm using here, clear like space? Was a, this was one of Zen Master Sung San's favorite uh, expressions. You know, clear like space, says, it's clear like space. Clear like space is clear like a mirror. 
red comes, red, white comes, white. Uh, I don't know how many times I heard him uh, say that. So um, several other times uh, I'll point out uh, language that uh, you know, I got from Zen master uh, Sung San. Uh, what would you say the um, best literal translation is of the Tung Jan Ming Pei, that, that fourth line, Chuang? Yes. Uh, yes. Um, you know, I'm translating the fourth line of the first quatrain. It is clear like space. And I'm just using Zen Master Sung San's language as a paraphrase, not a close translation. What would be a close English translation of that fourth line, just word for word? Sure. Um, the, uh, the first two character, uh, actually, they are together. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, the translation is uh, uh, indeed, or it actually is, that oh. translates the uh, dong ran. Um, oh. Yeah, we usually don't translate dong and ran separately. Dong by itself just means cave. Uh, no. But in this case, <laughs> it, you know, it's, it doesn't apply. Uh, the ming is bright. And the Ming is like in the character, the two part, one is the sun, the other one is the moon, you know, the two, the left right. and right and together, moon. that's Ming is bright. And the last one, Bai, is a color that's white. So bright and white, indeed bright and white. That would be the uh, literal <laughs> translation. Can the, the Bai mean besides white, simply clear? Yeah, it could be. Yeah, that's uh, that could be another uh, one is, there's no cloudiness in there that, and yeah, so clear, clear and bright. Yeah. Um, so I don't think it's a bad translation and it is no. clear in the space. <laughs> yeah. But again, I'm paying homage to uh, our old teacher there. Um, in the second stanza, uh, we have what Zen Master Sung San used to call opposite thinking. So to see things uh, as they are, don't be for or against. Uh, so he called that opposites uh, thinking. And uh, I tried to work that in, but I couldn't, um, couldn't quite make it work in the verse. Uh, it just seemed, seemed a little bit out of place. Uh, but um, one of the main themes, non-duality, not to, not to. Um, uh, and then um, the deep meaning in the third line, if you miss uh, the deep meaning. Um, this is a, a Taoist uh, phrase, uh, Xuan Qi. Uh, do you recognize uh, that? I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it. Uh, Xuan. Uh, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I'm uh, switching from the uh, several screens with the Chinese, with the English, and with the Zoom. So I'm, I may be missing some of the exactly line you were saying. So Stan, which line are you referring to? So I can look at my other screen with the Chinese character. So it's um, in the third uh, stanza, third line, the deep meaning. Uh, it's a Taoist uh, ex expression, um, Xuan Qi. I see, that's the third. Third line. Third, yeah, of the, of the third line, 不识选址, yeah. 不识选址, not knowing the, uh, yeah, the mystic. Yeah, I, I see the deep meaning. Uh, yeah, the deep meaning would be what you translate the, the last two character of this section, the 选址. Yeah, exactly. would the, yeah, would be the deep meaning you were referring to. Yeah, I can recognize that. So uh, we won't belabor this throughout the entire poem, you know, every phrase, <laughs> but I wanted you to have some idea of kind of, kind of the process. Um, I also, um, you, you can reference something from the Yoga Sutras. I don't know if many of you are familiar with uh, the Yoga Sutras. It's a Sanskrit uh, treatise on classical yoga as, as philosophy. Um, and um, there's a phrase in the Yoga Sutras, uh, Chitta vritti niroda. A chitta vritti means uh, just mind fluctuations, and niroda is uh, stilling. So this stilling thoughts, um, chitta vritti niroda. And uh, I know the phrase from the Yoga Sutras in Sanskrit, but uh, it co it comes up also in you know Sanskrit um, 
uh, sutras, uh, Buddhist uh, sutras. And you kind of wonder sometime which way the influence went, you know, from classical yoga, which is you know, about the time of early Buddhism, it's, it's, that, it's that ancient. Um, and then finally, it is clear as a vast uh, space. Um, uh, there, it's, a, it's another uh, Taoist expression, uh, uh, Shu, uh, transliterated uh, H-S-U, meaning uh, emptiness, vacuity. Um, and uh, the Chinese uh, word also uh, kung, meaning uh, emptiness, and we'll see that in several stanzas uh, that are coming up. So the main themes are being introduced you know, in these first uh, four stanzas. Uh, any questions uh, so far, or shall we? Okay, let, let's go on to uh, the second section, section two, which is uh, stanzas five through nine, quatrains five uh, through nine. And um, giving that the, um, the title, this is not in the original, these subtitles that I'm giving to these categories, but uh, these are all about meditation practice. So that's my title for this uh, second uh, section. And uh, I'll read uh, this section five uh, through nine. Outside, don't get tangled in things. Inside, don't get lost in emptiness. Be still and become one, and confusion stops by itself. Stop moving to become still, and the stillness will move. If you hold on to opposites, you cannot understand one. If you don't understand one, this and that cannot function. Denied, the world goes on. Pursued, emptiness is lost. The more you think and talk, the more you lose the way. Cut off all thinking and pass freely anywhere. Return to the root and understand. Chase outcomes and lose the source. One clear moment within illumines the emptiness before you. So some things maybe to notice here. Inside, don't get lost in emptiness. We all understand outside, don't get tangled in things. That's our usual everyday life. And uh, trying not to be entangled you know, by the matters of the day, but to keep a clear mind. So I think that's clear. Uh, inside, don't get lost in emptiness. And I think this is referring to emptiness as kind of, kind of a trap in meditation. Uh, so just kind of sinking into emptiness, into one being. Um, but it, immediately, the poem goes on, be still and become one. So there must be some difference between uh, stillness and being lost uh, in emptiness. Be still and become one. And confusion stops by itself. So being tangled in things, that's confusion. Be still and become one and confusion stops by itself. And I think the text pretty much speaks for itself here. Stop moving to become still, and the stillness will move. If you hold on to opposites, you cannot understand one. So this theme of uh, oneness uh, is prominent in this uh, section. So if you stop moving to become still, the stillness will move. Uh, so the idea is just stop moving. If you hold on to opposites, stillness and motion, you cannot understand one. 
you don't understand one, so this word is repeated in um, little lines, this and that cannot function. So our lives are very complicated. There's always something. That's the this and that. All the various things, you know, the functions that we have to perform. But if you don't understand the one, that is the single being that is you know, beyond all of these different functions and the source of it, and you cannot function, it won't work. I've denied the world goes on, pursued, emptiness is lost. Uh, these lines, I think, I think there are many of these lines are very difficult to understand at first reading. And um, I think we understand denied the world goes on, it doesn't matter what kind of recluse you come, the world is just going to keep going on without you. So don't separate yourself from the world. You have to be part of the world in order to help the world. If you pursue, pursue what? Pursued, emptiness is lost. If emptiness is pursued, it's lost. So if you sit and say, okay, I'm going to become empty right now, you'll never get there. And then a section on stopping the internal monologue. I think we're all familiar with the internal monologue. Uh, for most of us, that's pretty much what's going on when we're sitting. Uh, maybe not all the time. You know, you stay with your practice. Yeah, what am I doing all? And then before you know it, the internal monologue. Uh, it's actually a kind of a, a recording that just plays over and over and over. So the more you think and talk, the more you lose the way. And way here is a Tao, and so I capitalized it. Cut off all thinking, and that's uh, Zen Master Sun San's language again. You must cut off all thinking, he would say. Then you can pass freely uh, anywhere. Uh, what does anywhere mean here? What does it mean to pass freely uh, anywhere? Any situation that you are in, uh, moment to moment, you don't have to be tangled up in it. You can pass freely through it. It doesn't mean that you ignore it, but you're not dominated by it. And number nine in this section, return to the root and understand, chase outcomes and lose the source. One clear moment within illumines the emptiness before you. Uh, this reminds me of Chinul, the great uh, Korean teacher about the 12th century. Um, his uh, his uh, expression, tracing back the radiance, tracing back the radiance. So our know, minds are intrinsically, uh, you know, bright. Can you trace that brightness, you know, back to its source? So that's returning to the root uh, and understand. So I'm not saying that, you know, Chanul is even referring to this, and they're not exact equivalents, but it does come to mind, tracing back the radiance, rather than being ambitious, chasing outcomes, being ambitious about your practice. One clear moment within, the word for moment here is nian. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that well enough for you to understand it, Chuang. Yeah, it is, okay, good. <laughs> so that's a thought moment, is how I understand it. How would you understand the word with thought slash moment is the meaning I've learned for it in a you know, Buddhist context anyway. Anything to say about that, Chuang? I'm trying to uh, think here, uh, nian, yeah, uh, usually uh, by itself, uh, that means besides thoughts, it's kind of uh, emphasized on concept. It's like a, a framework or an idea, like yeah, a yeah. part of a thought. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> hmm. 
Yeah, I'm not going to say one clear moment with it. Mm -hmm. One clear <laughs> idea within. Yeah. I'm going to stay with moment, a thought yeah. moment. Yeah. An idea. Okay. Um, it illumines the emptiness uh, before you. Um, so here, um, you know, emptiness, you, to interpret this line, uh, has to be uh, illuminated. Uh, emptiness uh, need not uh, have any luminosity of its own. When you think of emptiness, do you think of light or dark emptiness? Or something that's neither light or dark. So, um, so this, in a sense, I think is emptiness here. Uh, when emptiness is illumined, it's prajna, uh, it's wisdom. At least that, that's one way of taking this line. So any questions about section two? I have a question. Yes. Um, okay, so in the, um, find which one it is. Um, on eight, yeah. stanza eight, and it, it is saying, uh, you know, cut off all thinking and pass freely anywhere, which mm -hmm. sounds to me like like stillness, but but maybe not. Well, but I think it's yeah, thinking as an obstruction. Cut off all thinking, uh, and then you're free. Okay. Well, if I think of it in terms, or then it brought to mind this on three, which is the last section. If you miss the deep meaning, meaning stilling thoughts is useless. Yeah. So here I cut off my thinking and I can pass anywhere, mm -hmm. but that's not considered stilling your thoughts then. I don't think uh, it's a contradiction. When we, um, you know, passing uh, freely uh, anywhere is not necessarily motion. <clears throat> it's, excuse me. <laughs> Uh, did that <clears throat> what I just said does that make any sense to you it does um, oh. it, it still seems to contradict uh, yeah. three and yeah and I, I think you will find many such at least seeming contradictions uh, in you know, the entire piece. Um, and I, I think they can all be reconciled, these seeming contradictions. So let's keep this in mind as a theme uh, running throughout. Anything else on this section? Then let's go on to three, oneness. Oh, Stan, uh, this is Sean here. One small thing uh, I, I kind of noticed. Uh, so in the uh, in the uh, section that says the more you think and talk, and yeah. then and, you know the two what what two sentence after that is cut off all thinking. Yeah. Uh, just a small thing in the translation. Uh, you know, in that third section, uh, yeah. it mentioned both cut off thinking and talking. Like you know, in the first one, you see the yeah. the yan and yeah. So uh, this one cut off all thinking, and then there may be an and an, an talking in the uh, you know if we translate literally. Yeah, thinking is talking to yourself, isn't it? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, good. Then uh, the third section, emptiness changing into things. You see, this actually continues from the previous line. But emptiness changing into things is only our deluded view. Do not seek the truth. Just put down your opinions. Do not live in the world of opposites. Be careful, never go that way. If you make right and wrong, your mind is lost in confusion. Two comes from one, but do not cling even to this one. If not a single thought arises, the 10,000 things are without fault. No fault, no 10,000 things, no arising, no mind, no world, no one to see it, no one to see it, no world. This comes when that goes, that arises when this sinks. 
understand right. both as originally one emptiness. Uh, for me, this is the most difficult um, section uh, in the entire work. Uh, some uh, things to note, uh, line 11, the world of opposites. Uh, this, I um, was tempted to use Zen Master Sun San's phrase, a phrase that, that he used uh, frequently is opposites thinking. Uh, thinking in terms of, uh, of opposites uh, rather than of mutuality. Uh, opposites thinking. Um, in uh, number 12, the second line, do not cling even uh, you know, to this uh, one. So clinging to the one, uh, the attachment to oneness, which would mean attachedness, uh, to use the Sanskrit word, to samadhi. So samadhi uh, means sameness, everything same, you know. Um, and then the next line, if not a single thought uh, arises, um, again, recalling Zen Master uh, Sung San's no mind, hyphenating the phrase, no mind. And uh, then in 14, this comes when that goes, that arises, when uh, this sinks. Uh, that's a way of expressing the teaching uh, that we call dependent co-origination. Dependent co-origination. So nothing arises uh, of itself, okay? but always in relationship uh, to something else. Um, causal relationship, so dependent co-origination. And um, understand uh, both coming and going, or coming and arising, going and arising, understand both as originally, you know, one uh, emptiness. So in emptiness, uh, there is no uh, duality. So as I said, I think this is a very difficult uh, section. It is uh, for me. Uh, the, any any thoughts on it? So I guess the thing that I kind of sticks out to me is the do not even cling even to this one. Yes. Is is that it, like the way I try to understand it is if I'm practicing meditation and I somehow arrive at the one but then i attach myself to it is that then yeah, i'm that, creating another duality with myself and, and this one uh, yes you also uh, create a lack of relationship between yourself and others so it kind of works both ways uh, at once i would say yeah uh, anything else i have a question um, uh, yes i'm working with uh, the version you sent on my phone and the, the original version I have. The line, um, if one mind does not arise, the 10,000 things are without fault. Mm -hmm. The other translation is when your mind is undisturbed, the 10,000 things are without fault. Um, uh, I don't understand if one mind does not arise. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble understanding, uh, hearing you. In the version I have, I, oh, you have another version of of, of the poem, okay? Um, but the, there's there's a big difference in these two versions on this one part. Um, which which line? Which quatrain are we in? Twelve. Twelve. Okay, go ahead. So, in the most recent recent version that I got sent to me, it says, "If one mind does not arise, the ten thousand things are without fault." In the older version, which I have, and I think it came from you, when your mind is undisturbed, the 10,000 things are without fault. Uh, I don't recognize that uh, second version. Okay. So I don't know where it comes from. But if, you know, if you compare translations, uh, I didn't, I haven't done much of that uh, myself, but every now and then I, you know, looked at other translations just to see what they have. 
Yeah, you'll find, uh, you know, not simply alternate ways of expressing the same thing, but um, a completely different take, you know, on the meaning of the original. Um, uh, I'd say, you know, I've done a lot of uh, translation uh, in my my life. Um, this is by far the hardest thing I've had to translate <laughs> in terms of, uh, do I have this right? Who knows? <laughs> what does this mean? <laughs> uh, so I understand your difficulty, and I'm afraid I, I really can't help you much <laughs> uh, with it. But, uh, that's, that's the sort of uh, that's the sort of text it is. I don't understand this one line. If one mind does not arise, yeah. things are without fault. Wouldn't it make be more obvious if one mind does arise? Uh, yeah, it could be the same thing. Just from different points of view. So, you know, which one do you like is, I think, the way to settle it. Which one do you like? Well, which one's more sense to you? For it to be logical for me, it would be if one mind does arise. Because mm -hmm. The objective is to put everything down. Yeah. Um, so, so when that happens, then the one mind. Have you ever thought of your thinking as making all the trouble that there is in your life? I certainly see a lot of my thinking that way. So, if no mind arises, so we have it phrased: if one mind does not arise, if not a single mind arises. The 10,000 things are without fault. So before, you know, human beings or other thinking organisms come into the universe, hey, it worked really, really well. And uh, we're the ones who are making a mess of it. And um, all you have to do is read the newspaper uh, to see the truth of that. So why don't we leave this as something that's uh, not completely decided? <laughs> And there are many other uh, passages like it that are going to be problematic. Uh, uh, Vera, do you have your hand up? Yes. Uh, the more I think about it, I do not understand what emptiness is. Um, yeah, yeah, no one understands what emptiness is. Okay. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. So emptiness can mean that there's no core of something that uh, looks like it's real and it's actually just totally hollow and an illusion. It's empty. Or it can mean there really isn't anything there at all. So it's like empty space. But we, I mean, physicists tell us space is far from em empty. You know, as I'm uttering this sentence, before I'm finished with the 10 billion neutrinos have passed through my body, more or less, I don't know exactly. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yes, even what we think of as empty space is uh, absolutely full you know, of energy. Um, I'm going to insist we go on. Uh, speculation is endless. But I really appreciate your questions, and it's better to actually to hold them as questions. Uh, than uh, to listen to anything I have to say about it. The fourth is Taoism and naturalness. Um, in emptiness, uh, the two uh, are the same, the one and the many. Uh, and each holds the 10,000 things. If you do not see great or small, how can you prefer one to the other? The way, Tao, of course, is calm and wide, not easy, not difficult, but small minds get lost, hurrying, they fall behind. Clinging, they go too far, sure to take a wrong turn. Just let it be. 30% charge. I'm sorry? Just let it be. In the end, nothing goes, nothing stays. Follow nature and find the way, free, easy, and undisturbed. Tied to your thoughts, you lose the truth, become heavy, dull, and unwell. 
So we have the way capital W uh, several times in this passage. That, of course, is uh, Dao. Um, for me, the last stanza here is the uh, most significant. Follow nature and find the way, find Dao. The word for nature here is uh, Xing. Uh, uh, Shuang, would you have anything to say about that? It would be spelled in uh, most transliterations, H-S-I-N-G, Xing, meaning um, Oh, Stan, I don't have any comment for this one. Okay. I, 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 yeah, I'm, uh, I, I can see uh, this is very difficult to translate, uh, uh, you know, for, to something that makes sense. So I'm following <laughs> your translation. Yeah, <laughs> the two and try to find which one is which. Yeah, uh, I, I can, I can, I can understand both, but I can see the difficulty in translating it. And um, there, there are two other uh, words here, uh, Zir An and Ben Ji meaning something like essence, a Taoist word for nature. And um, maybe we can say the same thing that you just said <laughs> about these. Um, this is not an easy text. Um, uh, any other thoughts, uh, questions uh, on this section? Taoism as naturalness. So, so, so Stan, I you know, so, you know, clearly, you know, the, the this, you know, your translated word here, nature, it's, it's beyond like, you know, trees and birds type oh, yeah. nature. Yeah, it's more like essence. Yeah. So does this, does it have any boundaries whatsoever? I mean, I would say no. Yeah, no boundaries. Um. I know this is your first time through this poem. It's about my 30th time, and I'm still having a lot of difficulties. You have a question? Emily? Yeah. Yeah. It's really Mary. Emily, it's my daughter's computer. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Hello, Mary. Um, that's okay. Um, <laughs> I've been going through this before, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I'm just remembering, I, I'm forgetting the title, but there's a Chinese poem yeah. where there's a man in a boat on a river, and that is the literal nature. And he allows the current to take him to this special place. Mm -hmm. Later, he leaves, and when he tries to find it he never can because yeah. he's got the purpose of finding it right <laughs> but i'm thinking that while nature is the essence mm -hmm. um there's something about nature itself yeah. that can be a vessel yes that's true and nature again with a capital n not just nature as we think of it as the or the organisms that make up our particular planet um, Sai Master Sung San sometimes used, used the term naturalness, uh, which for us kind of implies uh, not being phony, but that's not what he, he, he meant by it. He was, he too struggled with the English word uh, nature and sometimes used naturalness, original naturalness, rather than uh, original nature. Another question? Yeah. Um just like word association for me uh, yeah. when I see the phrase like follow nature I know it's a different language and, and and philosophical schools but it just it makes me think of the Greek logos the Greek bit. The, the, the Greek logos yeah yeah it's just like the, the same sort of like as you know similar meanings in certain contexts yeah yeah especially uh, in like Stoic philosophy, for instance, uh, like Marcus or the universal is, mind, I guess. I've heard a lot, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, similar, yeah, quite similar, you're right. And um, shall we go on to the one vehicle? 
Oh, Stan, uh, and this is Sean here. Uh, now, yeah. I, after listening to uh, everybody's question, uh, I, yeah. I do now uh, seem to understand this a little bit better. Um, yeah, in the original words, I think the one that uh, was translated into just let it be, that was what we're talking about, about that nature thing. Yeah. Uh, the, the Chinese uh, saying was the fang zhi zi ran. And yeah. zi ran, I mean, nowadays we translate as nature, but uh, now I look at the meaning in this special, you know, this small section, zi by itself just means uh, itself. Zi is itself, ran is like this. Itself is like this, kind of is the literal translation okay, uh, of zi ran. So you think just uh, let it be is all right or no? Should it be changed? Uh, yeah, we, we let it be, we, we keep it more general. I think it's let yeah. it be, if we just keep make it complete, it's almost like uh, we let it be itself or be, it is like that. <laughs> That's pretty that much way, it doesn't it's make not, sense. Just anymore. Be, I think just let it be has that. Yeah, let it be, it's and it just doesn't general. continue. I think it's fine. If we let it continue, then let it be itself, let it be just like that. <laughs> kind of a, a interesting English. <laughs> that. Stan, you may have been influenced by the Beatles here. No, that's right. <laughs> Let's go on to the one vehicle. And uh, it's not a Toyota, by the way. Okay. <laughs> Not well, the mind is troubled. So we're continuing the theme from the last section. So why hold or reject anything? To ride the one vehicle, do not despise the six senses. Not despising the six senses is already enlightenment. The wise do not act, fools bind themselves. In true Dharma, there is no this or that. So why blindly chase desires? Using mind to grasp mind is the original mistake. Peaceful and troubled are only ideas. Enlightenment has no likes or dislikes. All opposites arise from faulty views. Illusions, flowers in the air. Why try to grasp them? Win, lose, right, wrong, put it all down. I think most of us would recognize put it all down as a Zen master Sung San <laughs> expression. He was always saying that, <laughs> put it all down. Uh, other notes that I have, the one vehicle in Sanskrit is eka yana. Uh, eka means one and yana means vehicle. Uh, eka yana, the one vehicle as uh, attention to all manifestations in this world through unity of all six senses, including mind. So, uh, in other words, a uh, comprehensive approach to the world with uh, everything in our psychological makeup, you might say, unity of all the six senses, uh, including mind, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, mind. I don't know why including mind uh, is here because, well, it's made clear that mind is, you know, the sixth uh, sense. So not despising the six senses is already enlightenment. So we tend to think of enlightenment as something really ethereal in another world, and but uh, really paying attention, really paying attention with all the six senses all the time is, the text says here, that's enlightenment. Another note that I have is in, on 21, um, uh, using mind to grasp mind is the original mistake. So uh, the note is the fundamental mistake in meditation practice, using the thinking mind, a mind with which you figure things out, to grasp mind, you know, mind with a capital M. Um, so simply paying, you know, complete attention to everything, uh, moment, uh, to moment you know, is mind with a capital M. 
And the thinking logical mind is only one aspect of mind with a capital M. I mean, that line is kind of interesting as a, as a complete negation also. What do you mean by that? Uh, just even if you're saying not, you know, even if you, even if the line refers to mind in general, yeah. Uh, you, you know, there, there's a negation there, right? Using, in other words, I guess I'm, I'm thinking like there's no, no such thing as recursiveness. Not quite following you. I mean, the main meaning here, using the analytical mind, using our ordinary minds to figure out what mind really is. Yeah, and my, my only point is it's kind of interesting, e e even if you, uh, uh, those two uses of mind in that line, even if you yeah. set them equivalent, yeah. it's kind of interesting as a negation, because then, then you have a complete negation, right? Uh, okay, thank you. Um, what other notes do we have? Your opposite thinking is Zen Master Sung San's language, and put it all down, we all recognize as Zen Master Sung San's uh, language. Uh, I love the last stanza in here. Illusions, flowers in the air. Um, have you ever had the uh, experience, you know, flowers in the air? You know, as a, as a visual defect? Yeah. You have to be old to have experienced this. So. If you're under 70, never mind, you know, right? <laughs> All these little dots that are in the air. <laughs> uh, okay, whatever. Put it all down. Let's go on to meditation practice number six. If the eye never sleeps, dreams disappear by themselves. If the mind makes no distinctions, the 10,000 things are one essence. See the deep and dark essence and be free from entanglements. See the 10,000 things as equal and return to true nature. Without any distinctions, there can be no comparisons. Stop and there is no motion. Move and there is no stillness. Without motion or stillness, how can a single thing exist? In true nature, there are no goals or plans. Does anybody understand this section at all? No hands. Okay. I didn't raise my hand either, you'll notice. <laughs> but we can look at a few things. <laughs> um, hey, Stan. Yes. I had a thought about this. It seems to be... Uh, referring once again to um, the codependent origination. Codependent origination? Yeah. What do you mean by that here? Um, well, without distinctions, there can be no comparisons. So if you, uh, those two are dependent on one another. Yeah. If you wipe out one, you wipe out both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that I think that makes some sense uh, out of this. Um, the mind makes no distinctions. The 10,000 things are one essence. So there's only one thing, and our mind uh, makes it into multiple things. Uh, the deep and dark essence is uh, the, the Taoist, the Chinese word, Xuan, which can be transliterate, transliterated as H-S-U-A-N. Your name is close to that, Sean. <laughs> but there's a G on yours. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a wonderful word. You know, the, the deep and dark uh, essence. It's, it's so, um, and I would say that this uh, section is very Taoist. That true nature, in the last. Um, in, in stanza uh, 27 is a very Taoist uh, notion. Um, 
any other thoughts uh, on this section? I, I'm wondering if, um, you know, based on the other discussion about nature, whether mm -hmm. here essence and nature could be used. Uh, yes, I think so. Interchangeably? Yes, yes. Yes, uh, yes I agree. I don't remember if I simply translated the same word in Chinese differently. Probably not, but I, I don't know. You, you know, when I did this translation, I uh, worked on um, with, uh, from, a very detailed analysis of the entire poem, which really, which discussed every word. And uh, it was online, I didn't save it, I can't find it anymore. <laughs> It's probably there somewhere. <laughs> so if you want to do a search, you know, Xin Shen Ming, maybe you will turn it up. If you do, please do. I have in the second um, text that I worked with, I don't know, can you read that at the top? Uh, so this is um, about 20 pages, uh, Professor Dushan Pajin, uh, Belgrade uh, University. Uh, it's not a, a translation, but it's a pretty close analysis of about every phrase you know, in, in the poem. And if you want to get more deeply into it, I know that this exists. Um, I made this copy recently, actually. So this is online if you wanted to, uh, to look that up. Uh, not that it answers every question to probably anyone's satisfaction, but it deals with everything anyway. And everybody finds this text uh, really, really difficult. So it's, it's, it's deep and dark is what it is. Then uh, let's do eight and we're, clo we're closing in on the end. In the mind before thinking, no effort is made. Doubts and worries disappear and faith is restored. Nothing is left behind. Nothing stays with us. Bright and empty, the mind shines by itself. In the mind without effort, thinking cannot take root. In the true Dharma world, there is no self or other. To abide in this world, just say, not to. Not to includes everything, excludes nothing. Enlightened beings everywhere all return to the source. Beyond time and space, one moment is 10,000 years. Uh, the mind before thinking, uh, Zen Master Sung San liked uh, before thinking mind. You must use your before thinking mind. So mind before thinking is effortless. You just perceive. You don't reason it out. You don't think it out. Uh, in 29, the last line, the mind shines by itself. The shine is that word ming that we had in uh, the very first uh, Quatrain, uh, mind shines by itself. And uh, 32, for some reason I have the note, not two equals the one and the many. Not two includes everything. So it is the one and the many. And uh, one moment in the last line there is a translation of the word nien, N-I-E-N is how I have it transliterated, which means a moment or a thought or a thought moment hyphenated. That might be the best translation. Shuang is smiling. We have to find out why. <laughs> no, I'm just looking at the Nian. You, you see this character has two parts. Uh, uh, well, sorry, you can't see it. The Chinese character has two parts. There's a top part, there's a bottom part. Uh, yeah. So the top part means right now, this moment, or it means today, but you know, really it means just uh -huh. right now. And yeah. the bottom character is that heart, you know, the Xin, you know, the thing with yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that 
Nian, then we can explain, then we can kind of see how we understand this, this moment. Right, right now, <laughs> moment thought, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what you said. That is the hyphen sometimes, sometimes the Chinese characters really do explain things. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, okay, <laughs> maybe top bottom, like, you know, the moment mind with hyphen, but in the Chinese character, there's no hyphen, but the top and bottom. Yeah, top, top and bottom, they come together. That's great. Thank you. Okay, let's look at the last part, um, which is Hua Yan uh, and non-duality is the title I gave it. Um, nothing here, nothing there, but the universe is always before you. Infinitely small is infinitely large. No boundaries, no differences. Infinitely large is infinitely small. Measurements do not matter here. What is, is what is not. What is not, is what is. Where it is not like this, don't bother staying. One is all, all is one. When you see things like this, you are already complete. Trust and mind are not two. Not to is trust in mind. The way is beyond all words, not past, not future, not present. Uh, so, you know, it ends kind of on a note of um, almost resignation. And we've been talking about this for 36 and a half quatrains, but we've been talking about the way, the Tao, but um, it's beyond all words. And then some kind of denial of time at the end, not past, not future, not present. Which is another way of saying, uh, you know, just uh, completely, completely not exist, non-existent. Uh, it's kind of a discouraging note to end on, uh, I think. But this uh, one is all, all is one is a the briefest possible summary of uh, the Hua Yen Sutra. So the Avatamsaka Sutra, have any of you ever seen a volume of the Avatamsaka Sutra? It is literally this thick. <laughs> On thin paper, you know, <laughs> 1500 pages. And, you know, it's really a compilation of all sorts of things. Um, uh, but uh, th this is not a bad uh, way to summarize it. <laughs> you know? um, one is all and all is one. Uh, Judy has taught and will teach again a class on the Avatamsaka uh, Sutra, which actually consists of I don't know, a good half dozen other sutras sort of run together. It's a, more or less a compilation. Um, and uh, some really wonderful stuff in it. And some just, for me, I just scratch my head and move on, you know, but uh, other parts just my jaw drops in, in, in appreciation. Uh, so some hands are up, I think. Yes. Um, um, I, oh, go ahead. Oh. I was going to say about, <clears throat> I think about no past, no present, no future. Mm -hmm. It is a positive thing <clears throat> because I think it, <clears throat> it might just mean that um, we are out of time, mm -hmm. out, out of, Inside of. Time, really time. which is time <laughs> just being a construct yeah. that we have created. I I came to um, experience that when I w worked in a mission in Guatemala. Yeah. With Mayan people in rural villages. Mm -hmm. Like, I, it was hard for my mind to comprehend that they were out of time as far as how I measured it. Yeah. Uh, they couldn't, the watch meant nothing to them, for instance. Uh, that's a wonderful experience uh, you had. And it's true that uh, different cultures sometimes have radically different notions of time. 
Um, another note that I have is um, the what is is what is not, what is not is what is, is a way of expressing what is called mutual interpenetration, which is a more positive uh, way of uh, expressing you know, being and non-being. What is, is what is not, what is not, is uh, what is. Yeah. I also like the infinitely large is uh, infinitely small. It's um, an interpenetration of both temporal and spatial uh, dimensions. Um, you know, trying to, um, I've never been able to figure out any of this in this last stanza, but I find it very valuable just to hold it uh, in mind. That um, it's almost like uh, like your experience, uh, you know, with the Mayan uh, culture. This something going on here, you know, that I don't really understand, but I don't. Uh, somehow you know that it's important. Uh, it's important for us not to be locked, caught in our own, you know, cultural framework. Uh, and uh, some forms of Buddhism and the Avatamsaka Sutra is one, uh, a way to break through that. And uh, Kogan practice is another way to uh, break through it. So that's the um, my my general take on this last uh, this last section uh, of the poem. Uh, anything else? Uh -oh. Someone is about to talk. So I was going to say stanza thirty three kind of brings to my mind like a Mandelbrot set. Like yeah, the more you go into it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's an interesting analogy. Yeah. Do, uh, Carol, you have your hand up, I think. Yeah, hi. hi. I'm going to take this in a completely different direction, so please forgive me. Um, yeah, please forgive me. In fact, you're thanked. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Um, so um, this whole thing seems to me, at this moment, I can simplify it for myself and for other people that I've done recently by equating it with the serenity prayer. Yeah. So, okay, so I'm not in the recovery community also. I don't know how they use it there, but I think it is used there. So recently I was studying Shanti Deva and I was reading in the patient section. And I'm gonna to read these four lines from Shanti Deva. Yes. It says, it says um, why be unhappy about something if it can be remedied? And what is the use of being unhappy about something if it cannot be remedied? Mm -hmm. So there's the, there's, the, there's the serenity prayer. So um, from Shanti Deva in the eighth century China. Yeah. Um, so it seems to me like, in the, so in the last two, in the last week, I've spoken to two friends, non-Buddhist friends and trying to talk to them about, you know, we're talking about our lives and such, and they can understand the serenity prayer. They really can get it that you don't you don't want something that you don't have and you don't not want something that you get, you know, to love what is in Katie Byron's words. And this is saying the same thing to me I, in this moment. That's how I'm understanding it, because right now I'm focusing on the serenity prayer aspect. Uh, <laughs> do you have a comment on this, please? Uh, yes, I think. Uh, does everybody know what the serenity prayer is? Maybe. Okay, we all have some idea uh, of what it is. I think that's a wonderful filter um, through which uh, to view the Avatamsaka Sutra. And any connections, uh, you know, the Avatamsaka Sutra is, for me, the most universal teaching I've ever come across. And I am not surprised when people say, oh, well, this reminds me of whatever religious or philosophical tradition they you know, might be uh, familiar with. But I, I do particularly like uh, your, your take on this uh, through the uh, serenity prayer. So thank you. I have a question, Stan. Yes, please. Uh, in, uh, in number 23, 
um, that really beautiful line, illusions, flowers in the air. 23, let's all turn to 23. Yeah, illusions, flowers in the air, yeah. That seems to be the only time in the entire document that a metaphor is, a you know, beautiful metaphor, poetic metaphor is being used. And do you have any idea why that would be shifting like that? I'm sorry, I'm having trouble understanding you. Can you oh, say that again? So that's the only time it appears in the entire document where there's a metaphor, poetic metaphor. The illusions, flowers in the air. Yes, that's it doesn't occur anywhere else except here. And so what is your observation or your question? My question is, why do you think that that this was put in here? Oh, oh OK. So let's look at 23. Um, everyone. Uh, so the previous uh, quatrain ended, excuse me, <coughs> um, well, the previous quatrain, peaceful and troubled are only ideas. Enlightenment has no likes or dislikes. All opposite arise from faulty views. So I think the illusions, flowers in the air, is another way of expressing that all this is only ideas, you know, peaceful and trouble. They're illusions. They have no substance. Um, I think that's the function that it has. And so since they are illusions, uh, you know, why try to grasp them? Simply recognize them uh, as uh, illusions. And then he goes on to say, win, lose, right, wrong. Yeah. Put it all down. And again, put it all down is... The, um, the spirit of what the um, the Chinese text actually uh, says, but uh, again, I use one of Zen Master Sung San's uh, expressions. So there's no um, there's no substance you know, to most of our ideas. They're simply ideas. Now they can be useful. They can do good. They can do harm, but uh, in themselves, they have no essence. And that, this may strike you as a uh, wait a minute, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, sort of um, teaching. But uh, I encourage you to uh, live with it uh, uh, for a while. Um, again, Kongan practice can really help. Uh, with this. Um, it's sort of natural when you're faced with one of these Konglan questions to have some idea uh, about it. And usually the, uh, what you have to do is to break through uh, that, I, that idea. And uh, all of you I know to a certain extent are engaged in Konglan practice, so you know what I'm talking about, I'm sure. Uh, we have time maybe for a couple of more questions or observations. In that that line, we read a, a Kongan as part of practice the other morning, uh, and there was one of the concluding lines was plum blossoms in snow or plum blossoms in winter. A similar expression, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they, um, they, they may exist at most for a while, then boom, they're gone. Well, okay, anything else? So I think this has been, uh, you know, a, a very good introduction to this uh, this text. Are you waving goodbye, or you have something to say? No, I, I you know, I, as I was reading this, uh, I felt like I'd seen this someplace before, and you've seen it in a lot of places before, <laughs> right? <laughs> if you practice, uh, but it, I mean, I think you know, during the a uh, couple of years ago, during the height of the pandemic, the Judy did a class on you know fundamental wisdom of the middle way. Yeah, and at least you know, in in the in the four line you know quartet sort of form, there's a lot of similarity here. And uh, yeah, there, there's a similarity in you know the poetic expression, I suppose. Um, Again, this is unusual in Chinese in that uh, four syllables, so four words, 
or per, per line. It's it's the punchiest document in Buddhism. You can say that for it. <laughs> um, but yeah, in Zen especially, there are similar um, similar compositions, and um, it might be nice to uh, teach those uh, too whenever we do in the future. It'll be years before this is taught again, but also the fundamental wisdom of the middle way. Maybe teach them back to back. That's not a bad idea. No. It, it also seems like the kind of thing that we ought to read maybe, you know, part of during retreats. <laughs> well, um, what do you mean, read part of during retreats? Or read the whole thing. I mean, if it's not too much, you know, you can, you can oh, just go around the room like, like we read the temple rules. Oh, I see. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know that um, we, we'll be doing that, but um, it's not a bad idea uh, at all. I don't think enough attention is paid to it uh, in general. Now, it is um, the very first uh, Zen poem you know, by one of the earliest teachers. Oh, I should mention, if you look this uh, up, the Xin Xin Ming on Wikipedia, you will find uh, some speculation that this wasn't written by Sung San and it wasn't composed until the 11th century, you know, much less, uh, you know, the 6th century. Uh, don't pay any attention to that. Bear in mind that anybody can write a Wikipedia article. You know, they're, they're only vetted for things that are uh, outrageous and um, offensive. Um, I've never seen any evidence that uh, this is not Sung San, uh, third in the Zen uh, lineage, and uh, it, it comes from him. Uh, is there anything else? I want to thank you all for all of your contributions and simply for coming. Thank you, especially Shuang. You've been a tremendous resource, but all of you with your questions and observations, I, I really appreciate it. Remember, the great way is not difficult. Just don't pick and choose. Thank you. <laughs>